love our purpose. Or as we like to describe it, our North Star, our reason for being, what our company stands for beyond growth and profits. Actually, the impact that we want to have on the world. How many of you out here this morning lead companies or work for companies that already know your purpose? Raise your hands up. Okay, that's good. How many of you are working on it? You're in the process of uncovering it. Good. How many of you are just curious? What is this thing that I keep hearing about? Any of you just sitting in the curiosity spot? And how many of you just want to put your hands over your ears and run out of the room because you're so tired of hearing about it? <laughs> you're just like, oh, we keep hearing it. Because purpose is all the buzz. You're hearing it everywhere. You heard some of it yesterday. We're going to be talking about it today. And it can promise to be a panacea for so many of the challenges that businesses face today. And it is offering some stunning results. So it's easy to see the allure. It's easy to get pulled by it. I'm going to share with you a couple of stats from research about purpose. It's touted to impact performance that purpose-driven companies saw 400% more returns on the stock market than the S&P 500. That's very powerful. You look at that and you go, yes, I want some of that. It's also tied to employee engagement, which we were just talking about earlier. How do you get employees ramped up and engaged? And employees who derive meaning from their work report twice the job satisfaction, and they're three times as likely to stay in a job. And you know with recruitment and retention the cost of replacing employees. So if you get people who want to stay with you, that is powerful. And one of the third stats is about customers. We all love our customers. But 79% of respondents to a survey said that they are loyal, more loyal, to purposeful brands. Well, that causes you to stop and think a little bit. You start to ask the question, or at least we did about eight years ago, with statistics like these, and so many people raising their hands that yes, we have a purpose, what is standing in our way of actually bringing it to life? What, you know, it's no longer a question if, that doesn't seem relevant or applicable anymore. It is basically how do we bring this to life? And most of the executives that we talk to say that they believe that purpose is important to their success. But here's the catch. Here's the important piece to remember here. What we are finding is they are not using it as their guideposts for making their business decisions. This is where the gap is. We believe in it. We know it's important. We've uncovered and found ours, but we are not using it as our guideposts for making our business decisions. I'm going to share with you what this can look like when this happens to a company. And I'm going to talk about WeWork, you know, the chic <coughs> co-working behemoth. So several years ago, WeWork was having problems with their cleaning staff. And it seems that the people that worked in cleaning their offices were working for a third-party company. It was a non-union group, and this group paid them as little as $10 an hour, and they had no benefits. Well, what happened as a result of this, that the, these workers went on strike. And when they went on strike, the leaders of WeWork had to take a step back and go, okay, what is it that's going on here? And they went back and looked at their purpose, which is to create a world where people work to make a life, not just a living. You see, it's not okay to say that you want that for some of your employees, but not all. And this trouble has 
kind of followed them to present day. In a recent article, one of their employees said, this is what's happening at WeWork. That people are hired, they come in, they're all enthusiastic and rah-rah about what their purpose is, and they're calling it a mission, but um, about what that is. They very quickly get burned out because it's not true. They leave and they hire a new group. So it's become this revolving door of people coming in for what they have heard is true, finding out it's not, and leaving. There are ramifications to this, and they are paying the price literally. Recently, WeWork has gone from a $47 billion company valuation to almost a third of that. They put their IPO on hold, and Adam Newman has stepped down as the CEO. There are real ramifications. It's not just words. These have an impact on how people feel and how they behave and what experiences they have. Because living our purpose actually requires that we make a few important mind shifts. So as we get into this mind shift piece, I think it's important to note how much beliefs shape everything that we do, from the actions that we take to where we focus our attention. I know this is really true in my own life. I have a pretty deeply held belief that it's my responsibility as a leader at Savage to make sure that my people are taken care of. And as I go throughout my day, I realize that I leave my door open. I realize that there's a revolving sort of rotation of people that come in and out of my office. I'm constantly getting pulled into different conversations. My attention is almost entirely directed outwardly. And oftentimes at the end of the day, I'll realize that I've actually done nothing that was on my list. So I think this is one of the ways we can see our beliefs really shaping how we show up in the day. Um, we certainly share some common beliefs around how we should operate our businesses. You know, we're relatively conditioned to think about driving growth and profits, to think about doing more and getting more done, and to think about how we serve our employees on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are some of the beliefs, these beliefs, these particular beliefs, are some of the things that we see standing in our clients' way as they start to um, deliver their purpose and make it real within their organization. And in order to truly transform our organizations, we really think that we have to evolve our thinking. We have to expand beyond what is historically known to us, what is familiar and comfortable. Now, we're not here to say today that we need to throw out all of our old thinking about business, but we do want to offer three mind shifts that we really believe are alternatives for your consideration that can help move your business forward. And these are, these are different ways of thinking about things that we really think are keys to unlocking the full potential of your purpose. I want you to pay attention to, to the two words up here. I mean, our, our graphics are very simple. There's very few words. But a mind shift is a powerful thing. And this very first mind shift that we're going to talk about is from doing to being. There is so much focus today on how much we get done. I know you all feel it. I know you feel the pressure of it. It feels like we are drowning in to-do lists. There, sometimes it's a red badge of courage. We start comparing them. You know, I have five things to do. Well, I have 12 things to do. Oh my gosh, I have 24. I mean, we feel like this is uh, giving us some, some power in having so many things to do. And that productivity is king. But there are, there are some ramifications to this. There's a price that we are paying for this. We are becoming human doings instead of human beings. And that space is, um, is kind of what we would like to affectionately call getting stuck in the doo-doo. Um, the, the, the price that we are paying for being stuck here is that there is more stress and anxiety on every one of us. It just seems that it gets more and more every year. 
And we are losing our ability to create, collaborate, and connect with each other. We need to start valuing more how we are getting things done, not just how much we are getting done. It, it, does everybody here have a to-do list? Yeah? Anybody, well, let's do this. Anybody that doesn't have a to-do list, raise your hand. <laughs> That's probably the easier one to do. Well, let me ask you this one. How many of you have a to-be list? How you, choose on, how you choose to show up? How you choose to bring yourself to your work? What are the qualities that you want to share with other people? Because ultimately, to begin being our purpose, we all need to shift our attention to how things are being done. Um, as a recovering duaholic and an aspiring <laughs> human being, not a human doing, this one hits really close to my heart. And I think when we think about what this shift looks like and what it means, it's really making an effort to slow down. It's an effort to make space for ourselves and others and for being really, really intentional about the way that we show up at work. I know I'll never forget a meeting I had at Savage with our leadership team. And I walked in, and I put my stuff down, and I looked across the table, and a coworker of mine had this like most hideous scowl on his face, like scrunched up, like just horrible. And he was silent almost the entire meeting. And I spent the whole meeting thinking, like, oh gosh, like, I don't know what's going on with him. He seems very angry. I'm so uncomfortable. And I remember after the meeting, I was so impacted by it that I went and asked him, I was like, Doug, what is going on with you? And he's like, oh, I have a headache. And I thought, oh, okay, that's, that's good news. But it's not something I did. And I, I think about how many times we make up stories like this of what's going on with someone else. Um, you know, as humans, we're designed to create meaning and to find meaning and make meaning in the things that we observe. And when we do that, we use the data that's available to us, and our brains are conditioned to sort of fill in the gaps. And I think this is one of the areas that we can really see um, how we show up at work it stands in the way of who we want to be. Um, and so I, I just think it's really, really important to remember that being intentional about that piece of how we show up can really impact the outcomes we have, how we interact with one another. Um, it, really, it really shapes everything. At Savage, we've actually developed a ritual to help us honor our being piece and to hold space in our meetings, not just for doing, but also for being. We do a personal check-in at the beginning of each of our meetings where we ask people to sort of tell us where they're coming from. So um, we ask everybody to report out about how they're entering the room. And we collect a wealth of knowledge in that process that informs how we interact with one another and really shapes our ability to have productive outcomes from our meetings. You know, sometimes I think we can walk into the room carrying a lot of things. We may have just walked into a meeting at the beginning of the day, being rushed, having dropped our children off at school, having done all of that, and you sort of come in in a flurry and it takes you a minute to arrive. And I think this, this aspect of really making space for doing that can be really important. Because when we really get clarity on where people are coming from, that is what affects our impact, both on other people and also on the outcomes in the room. Um, this next example I want to share with you, um, I think has everything to do with how our intention and how we come into a room does shape outcomes. Gerald Japlansky, who is the father of an arm of psychology based on attitude, was asked to attend a board meeting for a company that was having a lot of challenges um, trying to work through a specific issue. And so they invited him to come in and consult with them and be a part of their board meeting so that he could help facilitate them working through this issue. And Gerald showed up at this meeting and he sort of meandered into the room, found a seat, and he sat quietly and observed what was going on in the room. And he had so much compassion for how much they were struggling that he was holding throughout that meeting and just witnessed what they were doing. 
And I love this because at the end of the meeting, several people walked up to Gerald and just were like effusively telling him how great what he had said was and how much that he like helped them get clarity on their issue. And obviously Gerald said nothing in this instance, and yet he had a profound effect on this team. He was able to make a space for them where they were able to actually work through their issue. He set his intention on what he wanted for the group, and just by doing that, really helped them. You know, when we do start to excuse me, when we do start to value how we do what we do as much as how much we do, we really are each able to assume greater responsibility for the impact that we have on others. We uh, we always say at Savage that you can't spread the magic if you don't have it in you, and I think that's all of what this shift is about. I want some magic. <laughs> I'm gonna spread some magic. Let's go to the second mind shift, which is from customer to employee. From customer first to employee first. So hang in there with me on this one. We're always talking about what we want for our customers and what we want from our employees in order to give what our customers need to them. You might have heard that and said, well, wait a minute. The standard argument is, if we don't have customers, we don't have a business. Well, we at Savage think that that is the wrong end of the equation. If you don't have good employees, you don't have people to provide your goods and services to your customers. We want to start at the other end of the equation. Yesterday in the opening remarks, you heard Chad say, happy employees make happy customers. And if you take, take Herb Keller's Southwest Airlines version of that, he continues on to say, happy employees make happy customers, happy customers make happy shareholders in that order. And it's no big surprise that Southwest Airlines, who started with a well-defined purpose in the 70s that they still have to this day, is the only airline that we know of that has been in the black every single year of their existence. And talk about honoring employees. They not only have great training, they have very happy people, but they have never had, to this day, an involuntary furlough. And imagine that with the size company that they are. I, g I get a little clump sometimes when I talk about her because I think he was just a magic unicorn, um, a magic unicorn who smoked cigarettes and drank whiskey at lunchtime. You know, he was just he was just himself, but he truly cared about people. And when you saw him in an airport, it was like he was a rock star. And it wasn't the, his customers, it was the people that worked for him that were coming up and wanting to take a selfie and wanting to tell him a story and wanting to show him pictures of their children. There's a real connection with how he felt about these people. Another one of these magic unicorns to us is um, Kip Tyndall of the Container Store. They have one of the most robust training programs you've ever seen. P.S. to sell cardboard and plastic you know, they're not selling great intellectual property. It is solutions for storing things. You can buy cardboard and plastic at so many places. Why do you pay more to go to the container store? Well, they have trained their people to sell solutions, not to sell things. And a very quick story, a few months ago I was on my way to a meeting, but I had something that I wanted to pick up at the container store. I knew they had it. And I got there about quarter till 10. So I parked my car and I sat outside on a bench outside the doors waiting for them to open so I could buzz in and get it and come out. About seven minutes till 10, I noticed two people walk up to the doors, unlock them, and open them, and each one stand on one side of the open doors. I kind of looked around for what's going on here. I'm questioning if they're open, and I see them waving me in. So I walked in, and as I walked through the double doors, these people on either side of me said, good morning, welcome to the container store. Can we help you find something or solve a problem? I said, wait a minute, 
hold on, <laughs> this is too much for me. First of all, you opened seven minutes early. That sort of blew my mind. Secondly, two of you are up here at the front of the store greeting me and asking me how you can help. I feel like I'm your only customer. The guy said, well, at this time of the day you are. <laughs> You're the only one, so have at it. But the way that they made me feel as a customer was based on how they felt about their jobs. They were empowered to open those doors when they see fit. If they see people waiting outside, they were empowered as employees to do that. Because you see, when you fill your employees' cups first, they will do everything in their power to do the same for others. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about what it takes to fill our employees' cups. I know we heard a lot of conversation yesterday about the importance of employee experience. And we really believe that the experiences that your employees have at your company have everything to do with driving the results that you want within your business. Um, and we believe that by focusing on what you want for your employees and creating conditions that support them in being and doing their best, that is where we create these scenarios that win for everyone. They win for the individuals that work for you, they create wins for your customers, and they create wins for your business. So when we talk about creating conditions that support people in being and doing their best, what does that look like? And one of the things that is key to this is connecting them with work that matters. So that is the purpose piece of this. This is when people are showing up every day in awe of the fact that they get paid to do something that they would gladly do for free. I think another one of these conditions that supports people in doing and being their best is giving them a say, honoring their voices, and really trying to make sure that they know that their input is heard and received, involving them in conversations from everything from your operations to your business strategy. The next condition that supports them in being and doing their best is showing them that you care. And this really extends beyond the job function that they provide. I know we've heard a lot of, of talk here that you guys already are doing some of that work, but making sure that they're cared for as an individual. And the last piece, we've definitely heard you say that you have your eyes on. Um, I think Chad said yesterday that uh, training and development is the place that people in the AEC industry most want to focus and are feeling good about that. But we believe this extends beyond what they want for themselves professionally and trying to tap into what their aspirations are for their lives and supporting them in doing that as well. So what happens when employees are truly experiencing these things within your client, within your companies, is that they really are, they go home more satisfied and fulfilled. And when you are able to do that for employees, you create this army of people who are highly motivated and care deeply about your customers, about one another, about your company. And this is truly like, this is the secret sauce. This is when we talk about employee engagement. This is how we fire people up from within. And that's really the key to how we sort of navigate through the low times. It's what makes us resilient in those times. And it's what lifts us to even higher heights in the good times. So what does this particular mind shift look like in action? I'm gonna tell you about a company called Barry Waymiller. And Barry Waymiller is a global capital equipment engineering construction company. I love to say that because so many times we get accused of using retail examples when we start telling stories about how purpose works and what this looks like inside of companies. And they go, oh yeah, but that's retail. That's B2C. We're B2B. You don't understand us. And this is a really wonderful B2C example, but we call all interactions H to H. We are all human beings, regardless of who you are working with and selling to, and who you are partnering with. So Barry Waymiller, several years ago, came up with what they call their, guide, their um, guiding principles of leadership. And at the top of this page, it says, we measure success by the way we touch people's lives. I know measurement is a part of business, and we measure all kinds of things, and we measure a lot of important things. 
But measuring success by the way you touch people's lives, I mean, the audacity of these guys to say that. How do you do that? What is that about? And right underneath that heading, they have a line that says, we create an environment that is based on trust. Well, Bob Chapman, the CEO of Barry Waymiller, realized that he couldn't just take these words and put them on a poster and slap it on the wall and get it into the hearts of people and make it real. So he took it on the road. And he went around to all of his different locations and he started talking to employees. And he said, this is what we've come up with. This is what we say we believe. How are we doing? And he came across a veteran machine tester named Ron Campbell. And Ron was a salty guy. He'd been there for a while and he didn't pull any punches. So when he was asked the question, how are we doing? He looked at Bob Chapman and he said, well, sir, let me ask you this. If I tell you the truth, will I still have a job tomorrow? Bob said, sure, let's hear it. He knew something was coming. So Ron said, I see that you have trust at the top of this document here. And I'm, as I sit here today, I'm going to tell you, I do not feel trusted at this company. Let me tell you my experience. I walk in every morning, generally about the same time that one of the ladies from accounting comes in. We walk down the hall, she goes to the right to accounting, I go to the left to the machine shop. I have to punch a time card to get in the door. She does not. If I have a doctor's appointment, my supervisor has to sign off for me and I get docked for the time that I'm not on the job. She does not. If I want to use my phone or even go get a cup of coffee, I have to wait for an assigned break time to leave my post to do that. She does not. Sir, it seems to me like you trust some people in this company, but not the rest of us. Well, you can imagine that was a little difficult to hear after he was so raw, raw and excited about what they've come up with, to hear that this was not true for a lot of his employees. Well, what Bob Chapman did was he didn't gather the board together, he didn't get a committee, he didn't study it, he didn't spend months thinking about it. The very next day, he had every single time clock pulled out of every single location of the company. And they did other trust, destroyed other trust destroying. They got, a, well, let me rephrase that one. They did away with, how about that? Other trust destroying practices as well. They had um, wire cages around all of their equipment and supplies. And the employees had said, that makes us feel like you believe we're going to steal this stuff from you. They got rid of them. They started to tell employees that they respected them and that this trust was real. And when they saw it happening, the loyalty was amped up to the nth degree. To me, the magic of this is that these were not words on a piece of paper. They actually started making them real. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about the third mind shift, moving from a focus on profits to a focus on purpose. This is really about redefining or expanding our view of what success in business looks like from measuring dollars to measuring the impact that we have. For nearly 50 years, we have all sort of widely embraced the idea that maximizing profits is the sole purpose of a for-profit business. And it's no surprise that as a result of that, we turn to things like utilization, profitability, um, driving revenues up, opening new businesses, expanding, finding new client banks to drive our businesses forward. And the trouble with this is that growth and profit aren't actually strategies, they're outcomes that we want. Purpose is in fact, and it offers a strategy, one that has been proven to drive growth and profits. As Doug said, we always say at Savage that purpose drives performance and performance drives profits. And we measure the way that we measure the success of a purposeful business has to look different. We have to have yardsticks that allow us to measure the impact that we're having. 
And I love, Jackie brought up Barry Waymiller. There's actually another wonderful example of this sort of in action. How do you measure based on your impact? They measure their success by the way they touch the lives of people. And recently, when they had an increase in safety incidents, they pulled the entire company together to determine how they were going to fix this problem. And instead of turning to metrics like what the cost of their workman's compensation was, they started looking at how they could create a program that enabled them to measure the condition in which they were sending people home each day. Were they going home the same or better than when they arrived? We are really hardwired to measure things. That's just another way that we as humans sort of operate. We love measuring things. It lets us know if we're making progress towards something. And so it's critically important that we identify measures that allow us to determine whether we're making an impact towards advancing our purpose, or else we're likely just to default back to sort of our common growth and profits. We also are fully acknowledging that growth and profits are a key part of your business. It's just the switching the, the sort of means to how you get to that. So when you're looking to redefine your success in terms of purpose, you really have to get crystal clear on the impact that you want to make on each of your stakeholders and then create metrics that allow you to measure that and the progress that you're making towards the impact that you want to have in the world. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Brene Brown and she has said a lot of great and wonderful things. One of my favorite quotes of hers is, stories are just data with a soul. So you've heard us tell several stories and what we know is that we can give you a lot of information but I think if we place it inside of a story, you'll be more likely to remember what the reason is that we're telling it. It's not just to share a story with you, but to show you organizations who are actually making these things happen that we're talking about. They look like three very simple mind shifts, but they're very profound in the way that you run your companies. This story that I'm gonna share with you right now is about Patagonia, the clothing company. And Patagonia is, is um, very uh, strongly valuing transparency and impact. It's very important to their company to share what it is that they're doing very transparently, but they're con they are concerned with the impact that all companies are having on the planet. They started looking at their supply chain to see if the people that they were partnering with we're actually doing harm to the planet or taking care of it. The Patagonia purpose is stated as we're in business to save our home planet. Now, you wouldn't think that. You would think we're in business to sell you some jackets. And I don't know if any of you saw years ago, they actually ran some advertising saying, don't buy these jackets. Don't buy this jacket. Did anybody ever see those? Full page ad with a jacket, don't buy it. And the copy underneath it said, if you already have a lot of jackets and you don't need one, don't buy one just to have another jacket. Buy one if you need a jacket. And they were pushing against consumption for consumption's sake. They wanted people to wear them because they needed them. So in order to check out the supply chain to see if they were in alignment with what the company stands for, in the 90s, so think about that. This wasn't like four years ago. In the 90s, they took these steps to take tours around the California cotton farms to see how conventional cotton was grown and harvested. And they saw firsthand the damage that it was doing in poisoning the air, the soil, and the groundwater. And this affected the leaders of Patagonia very strongly. So in that moment, they made the decision to go 100% organic cotton. And this was not easy at the time because there was not a lot of organic cotton being grown. And they had to figure out how to make that happen. But more than that, when you want to talk about going from a profit-driven strategy to a purpose-driven strategy, 20% of their clothing was made from organic cotton. That is not small to make that switch and $20 million was at stake in making this decision. And I think many of us would fold under that pressure, or we'd try to find a way to ease into it and maybe go in that strategy slowly. 
but they just ripped the Band-Aid off and said, that's what we're doing. Not only did they do that for themselves, but they took employees on these same tours. And rather than telling them why they were doing it and what the impact was, they let their employees see firsthand what was happening with growing conventional cotton. And one of their employees in an article said, I was so impacted by actually seeing this for myself and understanding why my company was making this decision that it not only connected me more strongly with the people I worked with and having a, a connection to why this was important to us, but this decision has spilled over into my personal life and many of my colleagues' personal lives, that we buy organic products for our families. It is extended out into our home lives as well. Patagonia decided to put profit on the line to do what they believed was best for all. I love that story. I think um, it so beautifully captures what happens when we can coalesce a group of people around making a difference in the world. I know we heard Kit talk yesterday about a desire to grow his company so he could grow his impact, and we think that, that beautifully illustrates that. So when we are clear on the impact that we want to make in the world, and we have tangible metrics that allow us to measure how much progress we're making toward that impact, this is when you really begin to integrate purpose into your business strategy. And that is really the way that we both advance our cause in the world and we make our purpose real within our organization and we achieve the results that are touted for purpose. That is how we do that. We, we start to integrate that into the strategy and our decision making. I know that um, we've covered a lot of ground today and some of what we have said may have resonated with you, other pieces of it perhaps not so much. Um, I think for us, what we get most excited about is knowing that merely by sharing what we've shared today, that something has already begun to shift. And that is something that we believe has the ability to make a profound impact to elevate your organizations. All of the people within your organizations, your customers, and the industry, beyond what you may have previously thought possible. You know, I think one of the things we're faced with a lot when we're working with our clients is sort of a, hey, we need a checklist. What are the six, 10, 20 things that we need to do in order to make this real within our company? And that really looks very different um, for each of our clients and for each of their businesses. It is very rooted in the difference that they wanna make in the world. I think the most important thing is, is that we're moving in a forward direction. Um, to this end, we would really like to invite each of you to identify a piece of your business, an aspect of your business, or an interaction that you believe might benefit from one of the shifts we discussed today. From valuing, being, overdoing, from placing your employees before your customers, or from measuring the impact you want to make as opposed to the money that you want to make. And we just invite you that when you do that, to see what else shifts. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak to you guys today. Um, this is what Jackie and I are so very passionate about, and we are super interested in hearing about your own journeys towards being purposeful companies. We learn every single time we hear from someone else how they're doing this. So we'll be around afterwards, invite you to come and ask questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.